Hello, thanks to everyone for joining today's ACLU Town Hall. I'm Becky Edwards, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm Chief Communications Officer at the ACLU. I moderated a town hall almost exactly a year ago, and my, how things have changed. We have a new administration in place that's friendlier towards civil liberties and civil rights, but as a result and in response, we are experiencing a wave of restrictive measures in states throughout the country. The tactic of state legislators introducing harmful bills during a legislative session to galvanize their political base is not new, but the number of bills and their severity has significantly increased this year. We are now facing more threats than before on more issues than before. Take, for example, the extreme abortion ban in Texas, known as SB8, which the ACLU and our allies are challenging. In fact, we argued our case before the Supreme Court this very morning. During this town hall, we'll cover three things. One, the state legislative restrictions on our fundamental freedoms, specifically attacks on our right to abortion care, our right to vote, and our right to be free of discrimination based on gender identity. Two, how the ACLU is responding. And three, what concrete actions you can take to help. We also have a special message to share with you from fellow ACLU community members. So let's dive right in. With me today are three stellar examples of the ACLU legal and advocacy experts who are fighting around the clock to defend civil liberties and civil rights. With this morning's Supreme Court hearing about Texas's abortion ban, let's start with Bridget Amiri, Deputy Director of the ACLU's Reproductive Freedom Project. Hi, Bridget. Hi, how are you? All right, let me set the stage for our conversation. State legislators have passed more restrictions on abortion in 2021 than any other year since Roe v. Wade. Over 100 anti-abortion bills in 19 states across the country. A longtime strategy of anti-abortion extremists has been a chip away at abortion access while leaving the legal right in place, even if in name only. But since 2019, emboldened by the reconfiguration of the Supreme Court, they've been introducing and passing more outright bans that brazenly attempt to overturn Roe. We're now at an unprecedented moment. The Supreme Court has allowed Texas to enforce the nation's most extreme abortion ban for months. Then, after acting at a snail's pace, the court suddenly scheduled a hearing with just 10 days notice. So Bridget, what has been the impact of SBA on the ground in Texas? Can you tell us a bit about how it's affected Texans seeking abortion care and what kind of hardships they've been facing? Sure. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Becky, for leading this conversation. And I'm so excited to be in community with all of you. Uh, I cannot overstate the devastating impact that SB8, this horrible bill, has had on people in Texas. So right now, abortion is prohibited after about six weeks in pregnancy in Texas. And so that means if you need an abortion after that point in time, you must flee your home state and go to another state to get care. That's assuming that you have the resources and the ability to do so, which many do not. The people who are fleeing the state um, are going to the surrounding states, um, including Arkansas, Oklahoma, Kansas, New Mexico. States like um, Illinois and California are also seeing Texas patients. States in the surrounding area are seeing an, <clears throat> an increase in patient um, volume overall, and there are long wait times for appointments. We've heard harrowing stories of people traveling to get the care that they need, including dra driving 15 hours overnight with um, their kids because they can't find child care. Uh, we know that, for example, one uh, clinic in Kansas, in Wichita, um, and on one day, there were 25 appointments and 10 of those, pe those appointments were people from Texas. Um, so again, these are the people who have the ability to travel outside of the state. <clears throat> and that is not true for many people. Um, many people don't have the resources to do so, or they can't do so, um, given the fact that they might be young people who can't tell their parents, or they don't have documentation and can't leave the state because of checkpoints. And uh, we're really just so angry about what this has done to people, including um, hitting the most marginalized communities the hardest. Um, so um, the devastating impact right now includes um, the already existing crisis of black maternal mortality in the state, 
Um, so banning abortion um, just really adds that additional layer of devastation on what's going on in Texas right now. It's so hard when hearing all of those stories of, of personal impact to switch gears and, and think about um, the courts, but I think it's important that we do. Um, the ACLU is challenging SBA in coalition with our allies. And, and this morning, we, I mean, not me, but <laughs> you and others argued a case before the Supreme Court with very little notice, only 10 days. Can you tell us a bit about the hearing and along with the other abortion cases this term, including one from Kentucky and another from Mississippi, what's at stake? Sure. And also not me, to be clear. I did not argue in the Supreme Court today. Our fabulous colleague from the Center for Reproductive Rights argued the case. And we are challenging this horrible law in Texas um, with the Center for Reproductive Rights, the ACLU of Texas, um, Planned Parenthood, the Loring Project, and uh, a pro bono law firm, um, Morrison Forrester. Um, so this has been a case, a breakneck speed. So we've talked about the devastation that this bill has caused. And so we have rapidly tried to move to the courts to try to get relief for the people in Texas um, because they need access to abortion. Every day this law is in effect, people are prohibited from accessing abortion. And the court has yet given us relief. Um, so we are in court um, trying to get that relief. And the arguments today are about whether our case, the case on behalf of abortion providers and abortion funds, can move forward. Um, and the um, case that the Department of Justice brought on behalf of the United States um, is also about whether that case can move forward. So the question about whether abortion uh, is, uh, the, the abortion ban is unconstitutional or whether Roe versus Wade should be overturned is not explicitly um, in this case right now. It's just about whether the cases can move forward. Obviously, whether we can move forward and get injunctive relief blocking the law um, is, means, you know, whether the law um, can uh, can continue to have this impact. Um, and I should also say that Roe versus Wade is has always been the floor. It is the baseline. Having these rights on paper means nothing if people can't access abortion. And so what Texas has done is a cynical attempt to push abortion out of reach um, by banning it in this way that allows only private individuals to sue, uh, which makes it more complicated for us to go to court and get the law blocked like we have done in other states. But there are two other abortion-related cases in the Supreme Court right now. So one um, is um, has been argued by my fabulous colleague, Alexa Colby Molinas, um, and it's about whether the Attorney General in, in Kentucky um, can intervene in our case at the last minute um, to overturn a victory that we obtained in the lower court, striking down a ban on the most common and safest method of abortion in the second trimester. Um, the other case um, will be argued on December 1st um, by another friend and colleague from the Center for Reproductive Rights, um, Julie Rickleman. And that case is out of Mississippi, and it presents the direct question of whether Roe versus Wade um, should be overturned. Thanks for that. And if, and if anyone missed um, the, the arguments that Alexis did at the Supreme Court, I highly recommend going back and watching that tape on demand. It was a, a, an amazing, amazing argument. Such a great job, very impressive. All right, my last question for you, Bridget, for now, because we will bring you back, is, you know, we just talked about one path, the Supreme Court, but how else is the ACLU responding to these attacks on abortion care? Sure, and so... We still win most of the cases that we bring, and um, that is buoying. And recently we've had uh, victories um, in Arkansas and Tennessee, for example, blocking uh, abortion bans and restrictions. And we've had a very critical win in Guam where we restored access um, to the island after it had not existed for several years. And the only way that you could get an abortion is to fly 4,000 miles to Hawaii. Uh, so our victories are meaningful and they still exist. And every day that uh, we are able to maintain these victories, keep clinic doors open, it is critical for people who need the care. Uh, but it's not just about federal courts. Um, we are also bringing state court challenges under state, the state constitution, uh, also arguing that state constitutions provide greater protection than the federal constitution um, to ensure the right to abortion. And so we have cases going on in Florida, for example, in North Carolina, challenging restrictions under the state constitution. 
Um, and we also have a tremendous advocacy program that um, has been using grassroots mobilization efforts um, to pass proactive measures. And we've seen uh, measures that are pending in Illinois and New Jersey, um, and they will build on the victories that we've had um, in Massachusetts and in other places as well. Um, so it's all the tools in the toolbox, everything that we can possibly do to secure the right to abortion and make sure it's meaningful for people. Thank you so much for that, Bridget, and, and stay nearby because we want to bring you back in a, in a moment. Um, with off-year elections tomorrow and the importance of electing representatives who truly reflect our values, let's now bring in Sophia Lynn Lakin, Deputy Director of the ACLU's Voting Rights Project, to talk about voting rights. Hi, Sophia. Hi there. All right, I'm gonna set us up a little bit for the audience. So there's, we all know, there's no more fundamental right in a democracy than the right to vote. And the turnout for 2020, especially the presidential election was historic with a record number of Americans exercising their right to vote. But the backlash was almost immediate. Instead of celebrating the turnout, state legislators around the country introduced a tsunami of voter suppression bills that disproportionately harm communities of color. Sophia, can you give us a quick bird's eye view and, and give us a sense of the scale of these attacks? Yes, absolutely. But uh, first I wanted to add my thanks to all of you for, for joining us in this conversation today. This The scale of the attacks on voting rights this past legislative session was and has been truly breathtaking. As of late September, legislators across the country introduced more than 425 bills with restrictive provisions in 49 states. Uh, at least 19 states to date have enacted 33 laws that make it harder for Americans to vote, including in Georgia, Montana, and Texas. The strategy behind what we're seeing across these attacks is, as you've noted, Becky, not surprising if you consider the history of voter suppression in our country. And that's the targeting of the means of voting and participation that resulted in that historic voter participation, especially among certain communities that we saw in the 2020 election. So Sophia, I've heard you speak a lot to us at the ACLU about Georgia in particular and how Georgia, how, can you talk a little bit about how Georgia's laws make it harder for people to vote and the role that Georgia played in subsequent voter suppression measures that were introduced and passed in other states like Monta Montana and Texas? Yes, absolutely. Georgia's monster voter suppression law, which has been dubbed as Jim Crow 2.0, is a paradigmatic example of the kinds of attacks that we're seeing and facing right now. The law takes precise aim, as I mentioned, of the very means of participation that black and brown voters, voters with disabilities, other historically disenfranchised groups used to turn out during an unprecedented global pandemic. The law makes it harder to vote by mail, and it restricts the use of things like drop boxes and mobile voting units and out of precinct voting that were adopted in the first instance to help alleviate the inhumanely long lines to vote that has plagued Georgia polls. And in particular, the polls in black and brown communities. We all saw images of the snaking lines that stretched as far as the eye could see during Georgia's primaries and during the general election with voters waiting multiple hours in the hot sun in order to cast a ballot. To add insult to that injury, Georgia is even criminalizing efforts to support voters who are waiting in these incredibly long lines to encourage them to stick it out by offering a drink of water. By taking away the means to address those lines and give voters real meaningful alternatives to cast ballots, you're you're really placing insurmountable barriers to vote for people who are already stretched thin in their daily lives. People who have multiple jobs or caregiving responsibilities, people who don't have access to transportation, people who live in rural areas or far from a polling site or who work far away from their polling site. And of course, because of systemic and institutional inequalities and ongoing policy choices that perpetuate these inequalities, this is a group of voters that are largely people of color, people with disabilities, young voters, the el elderly. 
And what we're seeing in Georgia is not unique at all. The same kinds of attacks um, on, on voters of color, voters with disabilities, on the attacks of the means of participation that these voters rely on to participate, we're seeing those across the country in places like Texas and Montana. That's why we're in court challenging the voter suppression laws in Georgia, Montana, and Texas. Okay, that is a, a heavy, heavy burden and a lot of heavy information. <laughs> so how is the ACLU confronting these voter suppression bills? You mentioned court, but what have we been doing to protect access to the ballot in the lead up to this year's off, off year election and next year's midterms even? So yes, of course, we're using every every tool available to us, as Bridget mentioned, in the context of abortion rights. We're doing the same in the in the voting rights context. When it comes to what we're doing in the courts, particularly in light of the Supreme Court's most recent attack on voting rights and its Brnovich decision from over the summer, we're using every tool. The decision, that decision, and the conservative courts we're facing more broadly have underscored that we need to continue developing and using a range of tactics, laws, and different courts in order to give us as many pathways to success as possible. It's something we've always done, but d the diversification of taxes, tactics is something we'll probably be leaning into more. So for example, in Montana, where we're seeing restrictions that impose severe burdens on the ability of Native American communities to access the ballot, we're challenging that in state court under the state constitution where we've had success in the past. Um, in Georgia and in Texas, where we're challenging the monster voter suppression laws there, in addition to some of the more traditional voting rights claims we've, we've um, used in the past, we focused in on claims under the First Amendment and under the Americans with Disabilities Act, as well as other provisions of the Voting Rights Act that remain robust tools for us. But of course, we're not just sitting on our hands waiting for these bills to pass and then challenging them in court. We are working with our affiliates on the ground in each of these states to do what we can to fight these bad bills before they pass. We're not always success successful across the board, but in some places, including in Georgia, that on the ground work and behind the scenes advocacy and mobilization was actually successful in removing, removing some particularly bad parts from the bill. Um, so if you can imagine, those bills could actually have been worse. <laughs> and we're also really leveraging the ACLU's nationwide affiliate structure to help amplify the work nationally and regionally. The Southern Collective and our Southern Voting Project is a great example of this. These are regional working groups that work to share, cross-pollinate, and develop effective strategies both in individual states and um, in the South and across the region as a whole. These are really integrated efforts. And with our partners, we've had a number of recent successes. In the courts, for example, we uh, were successful permanently in blocking an illegal voter purge program earlier this year in, in Indiana. And more recently, the Fifth Circuit, one of the most difficult circuits we're working in right now, finally put an end to a case that sought to throw out the ballots of approximately 127,000 Texas voters during the 2020 election. Um, and, and one more thing I'd love to add is that while we're focused on the unprecedented wave of attacks on voting rights, we're also seeing a lot of positive movement in the states with 25 states enacting 62 provisions that expand access to voting this past legislative cycle. So the work that we're doing across the board is really paying off um, at every level. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Sophia, for that little glimmer of hope that you snuck in there at the end. That is something to be really proud of and to build on. And, and we know that that building is going to come from a lot of the people um, listening and joining us today because change is only possible if people vote and if people are able to exercise their right to vote. So defeating these voter suppression efforts and, and pushing for the good voting rights laws is critical. And I'm sensing a theme here, unfortunately, between your remarks and, and Bridget's remarks about, you know, people who are already, populations who are already vulnerable being pushed further and further to the margins. People who are already disenfranchised from access, voting rights or abortion care rights are, are having those rights restricted even more. So I know we're going to have a conversation in a moment about um, the importance of redistricting. So I hope you'll stay nearby, Sophia. Um, all right. 
So at this point, we're going to bring in Chase Strangio to talk about attacks on transgender people. Chase is the deputy director for transgender, transgender justice at the ACLU. Hi, Chase. Hi, Becky. So we've heard some other gut-wrenching statistics, but I have to say, when I think about transgender justice, I feel like my gut gets twisted in knots because um, 2021 set a record for the most anti-LGBTQ bills passed during a single legislative session. Over 100 anti-LGBTQ laws were proposed in 35 states with these bills overwhelmingly targeting trans and non-binary youth. I just feel like I have to take a pause and a deep breath there. Um, Chase, I know that keeps you incredibly busy, and I've seen you late night on Instagram events and at hearings against anti-trans bills in state houses across the country. These bills are particularly painful and galling because they involve kids. Why has there been such an escalation? What is motivating them? Yeah. So, I mean, I, one of the things I love about working at the ACLU is that we're always working in partnership across issue with incredible colleagues. And I think one of the things that is true, as we've heard from Bridget and as we've heard from Sophia, is that we are seeing, particularly in state legislatures, particularly in 2021, a, a rise in the attacks on people's autonomy, on people's ability to move through space, on people's ability to be themselves. And this is a part of that. So you, can, you, you can't really understand any of these uh, contexts without seeing them as part of a coordination. The, these, these state legislatures are working to suppress, to control, and to inhibit people. And this is a part of that too. And in the LGBTQ context, this is really an extension of the backlash to our success in the context of marriage equality. As soon as there was a victory at the Supreme Court in 2015 in Obergefell uh, v. Hodges, striking down the remaining bans on marriage equality, there was a pivot to targeting and attacking trans people. It was swift, it was aggressive, and it was incredibly well-funded. And we're seeing it now escalating globally. And here in the U.S., uh, the attacks on trans people have expanded in scope. And one of the things that was so jarring and scary about the 2020 legislative sessions is it was not just that we had a record number of bills. Um, so there were over, I think, 250 bills attacking LGBTQ people with over 100 focused just on trans young people. So many of those bills had hearings. So many of those bills passed through legislative chambers. And I think one of the things that we have to remember in this context in particular is that even when a bill is not passed through and, and, and not signed by a governor, the, the, the discussion of over it is painful. We're, this is young people hearing the government officials who are charged with representing them, demonizing them, telling them that they're perverse. Um, and that has been um, a real trend. And, and we some of these bills are so extreme. In Texas, which had 50 bills targeting trans young people, uh, you know, one bill would have made it um, child abuse for a parent or guardian to affirm their child. I mean, we're talking about threatening the removal of kids from their supportive homes. Um, uh, and then obviously there was 36 states that tried to ban trans kids from sports. So we're just talking about people trying to live their lives, parents trying to love and support their kids and lawmakers mobilizing to hurt, hurt those people. And that, that really is a, a, a scary and sad context to be in. Okay. Another deep breath. Um, as I as I process your thoughts, I mean, as these bills are being debated in state legislators, we're hearing very brave, and it seems strange to even use that word brave, because why should someone have to be brave to exist, um, and moving testimony from transgender youth and their parents um, about the harm that you just described. And I think we have a video clip. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. You know, I'm, we're just hearing, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, 15 year olds going in and begging their lawmakers not to, to target them. And so this clip, this is from uh, a, a trans, uh, young trans man, Eli in Texas. Um, so he, someone who is assigned female at birth, is a man, uh, a young man, and he, because of 
you know, Texas's existing already very restrictive rule um, was forced to wrestle uh, with the girls and, 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 and faced a significant amount of harassment. I think this is incredibly important, too, because so much of this conversation has been fixated on this idea of trans girls being um, allowed to participate in girls sports. But there are also, of course, trans men and boys out there, too, who are being forced also to participate in uh, on girls teams. And so that this is this is Eli testifying. I have one question for y'all before I start. Why in the hell are y'all doing this? There is no point. I am a student athlete, been for since middle school. Came out sophomore or freshman year. I did wrestling, I did marching band. I've had to submit my medical records to UIL to wrestle because of my testosterone level. Imagine the harassment I had to have walking into the girls' locker room. I have had permanent injuries because I am trans and was on the girls' team. I have had matches thrown in my face, and I have lost and purposely injured. I still suffer from those injuries to this day. High school sports is a part of being in school. Sports is the main thing. That's the only reason I graduated high school and uh, actually survived. The teamwork, the things that everybody's talking about, it is part of it, but y'all don't look at the the harm that the sports and this bill is causing to all of us. Wow, very powerful testimony from Eli. And I hope that all of you who are out there listening will do what you can with your own social networks to share some of these assets so that um, the, the test, that powerful testimony can be heard by, by more than just us on this, on this town hall today. Um, Chase, I know that you were in Texas last month for another public hearing about anti-trans youth sports bills, um, but maybe before the Texas House Committee. Can you tell us a little bit about what you heard and, and share some of those impressions? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, our affiliates have been leading the charge on the ground with local coalitions in so many states. And in Texas, it's been heartbreaking on all on redistricting on abortion. You know, Texas is in, you know, they're, you know, they're, they, Texas is closing out uh, or has closed out their third special legislative session. That's four legislative periods just targeting our communities. Um, and in the context of trans advocacy, it, you know, I was down there and it was incredibly beautiful to see. Um, you know, hundreds of people showing up on our side, so many kids, um, you know, testifying with so poignantly and begging these lawmakers, like I was saying, like Eli was saying, you know, like, why are you doing this? And that's what we heard over and over. And I think what's often lost in this sports conversation is why kids participate in sports. And we're talking about kids in high school, in middle school, in elementary school, who just want to go and and have a space to, to connect with their friends. Um, and it was a really beautiful time to be there. Unfortunately, you know, the bill was passed out of committee. Um, and though advocates have been fighting back so many successfully, um, you know, Texas has been relentless in continuing to call these legislative sessions. Um, and, and, and this one got through, it was signed by the governor. Um, and so now we're in a position where 10 states now ban trans kids from sports, um, whereas two years ago, no state did. Um, so we are definitely contending with a major, a, a major fight. Um, and, but the resilience on our side, though no one should have to be that resilient, is incredible. And I'm glad you mentioned the great work of the affiliates, and I'm hoping actually that you can dig a little bit more into that work that the ACLU family is doing, um, because you talked about the harm being inflicted on transgender youth. Can you talk a little bit about what we are doing to give people a little bit of hope? Yeah, I mean, I think exactly like Bridget and Sophia said, too, we are, we are just using every tool in the toolbox. And the the thing that's so incredible about the ACLU is that we are a nationwide organization with a nationwide affiliate structure. And so we have policy experts in every single state. We are uniquely equipped to battle you know, what's going on in state legislatures through the support of national and the expertise of our affiliates on the ground. Um, and then, of course, we're utilizing our comms resources because we know that changing hearts and minds is a critical part of this fight. All of the work that we do is simply not going to be successful unless we're telling stories alongside of what we're the narratives that we tell in court. And then, of course, we're also we're suing people. And we are, uh, like Bridget said, having success. We were able to block Arkansas's ban on health care for trans minors. Um, but you know, several days before it went into effect. And just quickly, another amazing flag is, you know, there was the abortion, uh, and, you know, restriction that was passed by the Arkansas legislature. We were both in court. Uh, they got their PI the day before we got our, our PI. Um, and I was emailing them being like, how do you deal with 
with with this particular set of litigators from the state. Um, and we blocked laws in Idaho. We blocked uh, laws in Tennessee and West Virginia. And we're going to continue to to fight. Okay, I'm, I have to ask this question because I may not be the only person listening today who doesn't know what a PI is. So can you can you de- decode that acronym? Uh, yeah, so a preliminary injunction. So you, you know to initially block the law while the rest of the case moves forward. I appreciate that. Okay, thank you for that, Chase. Don't go too far because I'll hopefully get you back in a minute. Um, so I said this before, but I think it bears repeating. As you listen to Bridget, Sophia, and Chase, I'm sure it's apparent to you all, as it is to me, that the most vulnerable communities, people of color, low-income people, those living in rural communities, those with disabilities and students are being targeted on multiple fronts with attacks on their right to vote and on their privacy and on bodily autonomy. All of this is being powered by fear mongering and misinformation. Uh, you know, the people who don't have the same values as us are using both of those tactics to push these bad bills. Um, and many of these measures have been introduced in the South and they reflect a legacy of systemic oppression, racism, patriarchy, sexism, and control over reproductive choices and bodily autonomy. Huh. When we hear about all of these escalating threats, it can seem really overwhelming. But the sense I hope you're getting today from Bridget, Sophia, and Chase is a, is a sense that powers a lot of us to come to work every day, um, that it isn't the time to be complacent or dispirited. We've got to stay engaged. Um, and this momentum for change, we know it's powered by you all. And we know and rely on your continued support and involvement. Um, they're critical. So we'd like to share a special video now of people like you who are engaged in the fight. Our grassroots army of ACLU people power activists volunteer their time and energy to mobilize and affect change. So we ask them to tell us what keeps them resilient and where they're dedicating their energy. And here's what they said. My name is Frank and I'm from Powderville, Michigan. My name is Isabel from New York, New York. Hello, my name is Milton Mitchell. Samantha Burnett from East Providence, Rhode Island. Amy Combs, and I am from Kansas City, Missouri. Shanae Williams, I'm from Winchester, Tennessee. Ruben from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Deborah from Alabama. I'm Simi Rizvi from Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Nick from Cincinnati. Hannah from Hollywood, Florida. Davey Stone Chung. Brandy Crawford Johnson from Kalamazoo, Michigan. Juan from Long Beach, California. Marge Othro, I live in Brooklyn, New York. And my resilience, it says here, probably stems from the activism that began in the late 60s. Fighting for systemic equality keeps me resilient. The LGBT community keeps me resilient. Wanting for our children and our youth to have a better future than our generation did. Being an ally and fighting for systemic equality. The constant pursuit of equity for everyone. Fighting for civil rights and environmental justice. And the fight for more equity, more compassion, more respect, and the fight for fair voting rights for all keeps me resilient. To be myself and to help others in their journey through my art. I will continue the fight for not only systemic equality, but standing up for LBGTQIA equality. Our fight for equality and impartial justice. Fighting for and protecting our civil rights keeps me resilient. And teaching students with disabilities keeps me resilient. Advocating for disability rights and accessibility keeps me resilient. What makes me resilient is the right to vote, common sense gun control, the right to organize, protest, and demonstrate. I love that. I have to say, I'm an easy crier, so I'm like holding it together as I listen to Bridget and Chase and Sophia, and I needed that little like ray of light from hearing all of those people power activists to, um, yeah, lift my spirits. And I hope it lifted all of your spirits too. Um, knowing that there are people out there who are taking individual acts to really form a collective wave of, of goodwill and harnessed energy for the fights that we are facing and we, the fights that we know are to come brings a, a lot of confidence to me and, and, and I hope it does for you. All right, so 
I'm going to bring back Bridget, Sophia, and Chase um, because we want to keep riding this wave of, of energy and um, and kind of build on what we just heard. And so I'm going to ask each of you the same question, um, which is, can you lift up what concrete actions our supporters can take to make change now? There's so much that everyone can do and everything that we do makes a difference every day. So go to your ACLU affiliates website and learn how you can get involved. Um, have your representatives on speed dial, your local representatives, your state representatives, your federal congressional uh, representatives, and call them all the time about the things that matter to you the most. Um, reach out to your local abortion clinic and your reproductive rights, justice, and, uh, and health community to see how you can get involved. There are so many ways to volunteer and to support these organizations, um, including being a escort um, at a, an abortion clinic, um, for example. Uh, so that's a way you can tap in to volunteer or pro um, provide resources on the ground. Um, and as, a, as we are proceeding with litigation, one of the other critical components is that the Senate right now is considering um, the Women's Health Protection Act, which could safeguard abortion rights at the federal level. So contact your representative. And I believe that we can uh, have a, uh, action on our website. Go to ACLU.org backslash WHPA. And you can take action there uh, to let your senators know that you support that legislation. It's a moment when we need all of the people out there speaking out about abortion, including businesses. So if you work for a company, urge them to get involved in the fight uh, that companies are engaged in to protect abortion access. Uh, and so if you're interested in this, um, don'tbanequality.com is the place to go. We know that that voice is critically important in terms of pushing the needle on our side. And also, there's an incredibly powerful reason why employers should not want abortion to be banned in the states where they're operating. And on the personal level, have conversations about abortion. We know that there's so much shame and stigma that surrounds abortion that's being pushed by the other side, and we need to break that down. One in four people have abortions in their lifetimes. Abortion is health care. So having conversations about abortion reduces the stigma and normalizes it as it should be. Um, yeah, so I would echo really everything that Bridget said, which is basically how I live my life um, and recommend that you all do that, too. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, our affiliates are leading the charge, you know, connect with the local affiliate in, in, in your state. Um, and and really, really, you know, when you're thinking about engaging your uh elected officials, don't just think about Congress. Obviously, that's important, but so much happens at the state level. So much happens in school boards, as we're seeing. Um, we are living in a time where, you know, there are people who are very mobilized around school board elections and what's going on in school boards, very mobilized about around what's going on in their cities and, and counties, and of course, in their state legislatures, and we need to be as ready. And so, yep, listen to what Sophia has to say about redistricting, because you know, sometimes when you're doing the work that that I that I do in in the states, I'm like, well, if they could just keep redistricting everything um, where there's no representation from anyone who supports us, then that's going to be a serious problem. Um, and so I think that work is critical. And again, all of these fights are are so intertwined um, in terms of what's going on in Congress. Uh, I would say, you know, the Equality Act um, has been pending for a long time. It's a bill that would, it, you know, uh, include explicit protections for LGBTQ people under federal, federal civil rights statutes. We have, thankfully, protections under some civil rights statutes um, through the prohibitions on sex discrimination that we were able to um, obtain through the Supreme Court's decision in Bostock in 2020. But there's a lot more we need. Um, so we need to be pushing uh, our senators in particular um, to move the Equality Act. It's already passed through the House. And, and similarly, like Bridget said, we need to have, be having conversations. These bills are able to flourish because of a climate where anti-trans sentiment is allowed to uh, exist. Um, and if we don't have conversations, if we don't change the public narrative, if we don't change people's understandings of us, our bodies, our lives, our health care, then that's going to continue to happen. And so it's on, uh, on all of us to have those conversations. When you go home for the holidays, uh, when you're with your family, have those conversations. That's ultimately going to be a critical part of the fight as well. Okay, Sophia, how about you? So I want to echo everything that Chase and Bridget mentioned about what you can do to be involved in this process. But as Chase foreshadowed, I think it's really important to talk for a moment about redistricting 
and gerrymandering and how that impacts all of this work that we care so deeply about and the policies that we want to live with. Uh, gerrymandering, you probably have heard it at this point, it's a big problem in our political process and it possibly the biggest barrier in ensuring that the policies that we see in our state legislatures, the ones we've talked about here today, that those, those policies across the country actually reflect the policies that we want to see in our daily lives. We've discussed these bad bills that we're seeing across the country, across all the issues that we talked about today and all of the civil rights and civil liberties that we care about. Those are being pushed by state legislatures at the state level and potentially even at the local level, as Chase mentioned, at the school board level, the county level, um, and so forth. These are not being pushed by the majority of people that are being actually living in these states, but by those politicians. It's really not a coincidence that the radical laws that we're seeing, the ones that we're fighting, the ones that are getting passed when there is race-based and partisan gerrymandering of the electoral districts that allow these lawmakers to really subvert the will of a majority of the voters in those states. The policies we're seeing coming out of these state legislatures are not the policies that the majority of voters in many of these places want to see actually in place. How is that happening? And that's because of the, the once in a decade redistricting cycle. That's happening right now. We're in the midst of that as we are talking right now. And this is the process that determines the allocation of political power at every level of government for the next decade. So this is our time and the stakes if you haven't gotten that picture yet, the stakes really couldn't be higher. It's really, really critical that we stop gerrymandering and we ensure that maps are fair that, that when they're drawn and that electoral representation really reflects the diversity of this country, the diversity of the communities that you live in, and ultimately the will of the people. And this is really the root of how we're going to ensure that these terrible bills that we are seeing aren't even introduced in the first instance. So in addition to all the litigation that we've talked about in numerous states and all the litigation we're planning to do and preparing for when it comes to redistricting, but across the different issues that we work on, we really need everyone's help to ensure the redistricting process is not rigged and that voters are the ones picking their politician, not the other way around. All right, now I'm fired up. Sophia got me fired up. So let's talk a little bit more about this redistricting because it's, as you said, it's at the heart of everything and it only comes around once every 10 years. So we better do what we can this time around. It's where we vote, it's who represents our interests. It feeds into everything that we've been discussing here today. Um, I have to admit, when I first started hearing about redistricting, I thought it sounded a little wonky. So I really appreciate some of the tools that have just come out, some of these digital resources. Can you tell us a little bit about it and how our supporters can use the, the maps and what they can do to help ensure fair maps and, and fair representation? Yes, absolutely. As you have pointed out, redistricting can feel like a wonky topic. It's extremely hyper data driven, map driven and technical. So we really wanted to be able to give all of you as many tools as possible to really dig into the issue, get your questions answered and go as wonky as you possibly want. Um, so we created a really, really fantastic digital web product at aclu.org slash redistricting, which I'm really excited to say is now live. This was really a collaborative process that brought in teams from across the ACLU, including tech, our analytics department, communications, digital, and of course, our affiliates. Uh, you can go on to the site to see real life examples of what redistricting looks like, how it can go wrong, what can be done about it, including some quick summaries of the redistricting cases that the ACLU has worked on over the decades and the ones that we have and will be bringing this redistricting cycle. There's also important information on really why it's important to pay attention right now and get involved. Um, it's, it's an interactive tool. 
that's just really fun to play around with. And there's also a cool function where you can explore how your district has changed over time through the district time machine map. So I really, really say, I really, really encourage all of you to take the time to go on and play around. It's fun, it's also educational, and it's a really easy tool to point other people to if they have questions about what is redistricting, what does it mean, how is it harmful, how can I get involved and help? It is really helpful when you start to get visual imagery to go with those really wonky uh, concepts. And that will be the last time I use the term wonky. Um, okay, so you also talked about the cross-functional nature of the redistricting team. And it is a beautiful thing to behold when you have all these d domain experts from different with different backgrounds and expertise coming together to like bring all their smarts and creativity to bear on this particularly essential time in, in redistricting. Can you tell us a little bit more about the team's work and the critical role um, that the ACLU is playing to stop gerrymandering and ensure those fairer maps? Yes. So for the last decade, state legislatures have been subject to extreme race-based and partisan distortion, leading them to underrepresent and disempower communities of color and leading to some of the attacks across the board that we're, we've talked about today. Um, this efforts to further distort the actual diversity of this country and the true political power of communities of color were blocked, thanks in part to our successful challenge, the Trump administration's effort to include a citizenship question on the census, which have resulted, which would have resulted in significant undercounting of our communities of color with devastating impact. So these attacks have been going on for quite some time. And we knew leading up to this redistricting cycle that we had to plan and we had to be prepared. So over two years ago now, the ACLU assembled a cross-functional redistricting team to make sure that we were prepared to stop gerrymandering and promote fair maps. We've always had the litigation capacity and expertise in voting rights, but we now also have the technical capacity for map drawing and map analysis that it forms the backbone of redistricting work that I just talked about. That's through our new data and analytics department, which has been incredible. This new team of experts has been providing really invaluable map and data analysis from the census and out of the state legislatures that has been the true backbone of our efforts to counteract current partisan gerrymandering and racist districting that we're seeing today. And particularly under the compressed timeframes that we've been dealing with as a result of the census de delays due to the pandemic, it's been critical to have this in-house capacity to really understand what's going on and as quickly as possible. When you combine this with our on the ground affiliates who have the local expertise and connections, as well as our advocacy and communications chops, which as Chase noted is so critical for lifting up these issues and changing hearts and minds, the ACLU is really, really uniquely positioned to have a national impact this redistricting cycle. Um, so I want to go back to when we were talking about the maps, because I, I forgot to ask you, you know, part of the investment in creating these great tools on the web was so that people listening today could get involved, right? So can you talk a little bit more about what actions um, folks can take to make sure that redistricting is conducted fairly? Sure, please, please use the tool to get it, to figure out what this is all about. Stay informed of plans to redraw federal, state, and local districts in your state. Timelines differ in every state, but redistricting sessions in state legislatures and at the county and local levels have either begun or will we begin shortly. So now's the time to start getting engaged, to start figuring out when meetings are, when um, your legislative sessions are happening, when town halls are occurring. And these are the times that you should try to attend these meetings where plans are being presented and evaluating. Um, try to offer your perspective about the types of issues that, are, that matter to you, the communities that are important to be represented contact organizations that are willing to help evaluate proposed plans and potentially offer alternatives. And of course, continue to write letters of support to or opposition to your elected officials, to people that are in that, that decision-making um, um, position and uh, to the Department of Justice, even if you are seeing um, you know, problems, if you're seeing concerns, this is Department of Justice, that's who that's who you should contact and they are there to evaluate these concerns that you're 
um, that they're seeing at all levels, um, federal, state, or local levels. I love it. I mean, this is giving me so much hope because I can picture like an, uh, we're sprouting um, website attorneys like myself who will print out these maps and go to their town hall meetings and hold them up like exhibit A of what we must stop. I love it. I love it. And it's giving me a lot of hope. This is exciting and really promising work. So, all right, before we leave, I want to ask you all one last question. We've heard from our ACLU community members about what keeps them resilient. As leaders of the movement who have to work on these issues day in and day out through ups and downs, as we've just heard, what keeps you motivated and energized and inspired? Um, How about Bridget, Chase, and then Sophia? So first of all, all of you, it's the community that we're in together, including the folks at the ACLU, the ACLU affiliates, all of our supporters, being in community with our coalition partners, that's what gives me resilience and it gives me hope because together I know that we can make change because that's how change is made, is by everybody working together. So that's what gives me hope and I know we have to have hope because if we don't, the other side has already won and we can't let that happen. Every day that we can keep clinics open, we can ensure that the people on the ground can make sure that the people can get the care that they need and that's why I come to work every day. Um, I mean, really same, um, I, you know, I wasn't lying about following Bridget. I, I you know, I, to me, um, working at the ACLU is such an incredible privilege because I get to work with the most amazing people and I get to meet the most amazing people. Um, and the work is draining, um, you know, as a trans person doing work for my community, it is awful a lot of days. It is demoralizing. Um, but then, you know, you travel to a hearing and your affiliate, um, you know, partners give you a hug, your coalition partners you've been working with for years are there. And then, you know, these, these young people are there. Uh, you know, I could not, you know, I couldn't do anything at age nine. Um, I didn't know a thing about myself. And there are kids who know themselves so well that they are telling the world who's telling them that they do not know who they are, that they are exactly who they are. I mean, how beautiful is that? And if there's, if, if, if there are people out there who are, are, are so able to be magically and be- beautifully themselves, like that's going to give me hope every single day. So I will add that one of the things that I keep coming back to when I want to stay motivated in this is this incredible will and resilience of the voters of this country who turned out to vote in historic numbers despite facing some really unprecedented barriers during the pandemic. This truly keeps me hopeful that the ultimate strength of our democracy remains resilient and committed. Thank you, Bridget, Chase, and Sophia, for having this conversation with me today and for working every day to protect our civil rights and liberties. I'm so proud to know you, and it's been a great pleasure to share your insights with our friends. And thanks to all of you who joined us today. We could not do this work without you. Your continued support, engagement, and activism fuel the movement for change. And for that, we are all deeply grateful. Goodbye for now.